the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakali. And I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me, also about the king's words which had spoken to me. And then they said, let us rise up and build. And so they put their hands to the good work. Let us rise up and build. I believe that is a good, noble, and scriptural goal for this congregation in any congregation. If I were in Columbia, I was in Winsfield, Boca Raton, Florida, I would be suggesting the same goal in all likelihood. Let us rise up and build. Knowing that our God is with us, let's put our hands to the good work. Whatever God determines is a good work. Now let's introduce the book this morning. Uh, chapter 1. Look at chapter 1 of Nehemiah now, please. Verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakali. Now it happened in the month Kislev in the 20th year while I was in Susa, the capital. Hanani, one of my brothers and some men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. The book of Nehemiah is about God's providential dealings with Israel during the captivity. And so the story does not begin in Jerusalem. The story begins in the city of Susa, Persia. Susa is one of the capitals of the Persian Empire, winter residence of the Persian kings. There are many Jews that live in Susa, Persia during this time, including Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. Nehemiah is a third generation Jew from the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. The time period is about 444 BC. The Persian ruler is Artaxerxes, son of the great Persian king Xerxes, most likely Ahasuerus of the book of Esther. He is in the 20th year of his reign. Now, as the book opens, Nehemiah has just received words from his brother Hanani concerning the sad and terrible situation that exists in Jerusalem. Look at verse 3, chapter 1 of Nehemiah and verse 3. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates are burned with fire. It's been 142 years. And to a large degree, though the temple has been rebuilt, the walls are still torn down. There's rubble. There's debris everywhere. To a large degree, it is much the same. But I want you to notice the response of this good man, Nehemiah. And as he closes out the book, he will pray, Lord, remember me for good. And here's one of the reasons we can remember this servant of God for good. Chapter 1, verse 4. Now it came about when I heard these words, I sat down and I wept. And I mourned for days, and I was fasting, and I was praying before the God of heaven. I want you to see that we are immediately introduced to a man of faith. He is a man of compassion. He is a man of action. And while others are mourning this situation, Nehemiah also mourns. But he mourns, and he does something about it, brethren. While others waited to see, what are we going to do? What's going to happen? Nehemiah saw the need and Nehemiah took action. That's what people of initiative do. That's what leaders do in the home and in the congregation. That's what people of faith do. We see the need. We feel the need. There's compassion as much as we're able to. And we take action. And the first act of faith is the most important. Verse 5, prayer. I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, great and awesome God, who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Nehemiah is a prayer warrior. 
There are at least 10 prayers of Nehemiah recorded in this letter. And all of those prayers express complete devotion to the Lord in the midst of tremendous hardship. Some of them are arrow prayers. I call arrow prayers. They're brief and quick as when he's standing before Artaxerxes. Some of them are much longer. But all of them show tremendous trust in the midst of the storm. Nehemiah understood there's something he needed to do, but you can't do more than God. And so he went to the Lord first, seeking the Lord's grace, seeking the Lord's power and strength. The walls were torn down. God can raise them up. Houses are still in rubble. God can raise them up. There are many Goliaths about enemies that are giants, at least to the human eye. But God is greater than all of them. Keep your focus upon the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 20. Chapter 2, verse 20. I answered and said to them, The God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and we will build. When you're confident the Lord is with you, you will arise and you will put your hand to the good work. Look at some other important elements in the prayer of Nehemiah, chapter 1, as we introduce this letter. Verse 6, let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you night and day. Nehemiah prayed persistently night and day. This alone, that fact alone showed how important this matter was to him. So important that continuously, persistently, Nehemiah was praying. This was not just a little dab will do you. I'll make mention of this and move on. It's night and day. He's thinking about this and he's praying about this. And then verse 6 continues. On behalf of the sons of Israel, thy servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, I and my father's house have sinned. Intercession. Nehemiah didn't just pray for himself. He prayed on behalf of the children of Israel in general. He prayed on behalf of God's people as well. In verse 8 and 9, he appealed to God's promises. Look at this. Remember the word which thou didn't command thy servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. Verse 9, But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote part of the heavens, I will gather them from there. I will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. Now we understand we can't give God information. Nehemiah certainly understands that. But at the same time, Nehemiah understands God is not angry when we remind him of his promises. God is pleased, in fact. You see the response of God. He will be pleased with prayers like this. With the, the fact that we remember these promises of God, and we hang on every word, brethren. We believe you, Lord. We trust in you as, in a, as a child. We want you to know we are hanging on every single word of those promises. A brother of mine back in Columbia, his name is Craig Roberts, and in many of his prayers, Craig would pray, and Lord, when our life is over, please give us a home in heaven. That's what God promised. God, of course, knows he's promised that. But Craig wants God to know, Lord, I'm hanging on every word. I'm living my life on every single word. And that's the very thing Nehemiah is saying now in his prayer. As a trusting child, I believe you. Verse 10. And they are thy servants, thy people, from whom thou didst redeem by your great power and a strong hand. I want you to see that Nehemiah saw Israel's needs. And this is very important here in the congregation. Were his needs. Their problems were his problems. Their hardships were his hardships. And his joys were also their joys. Many years later, the Apostle Paul would say this. I'm just going to cite this passage in 1 Corinthians 12. Let there be no division in the body. The members need to have the same care for one another. There are no vestigial organs in the body of Christ. Brethren. 
If one member suffers, all members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. You're Christ's body, individually members of it. And then verse 11, look at this other very important element of effectual prayer. O Lord, I beseech thee, may thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and the prayer of thy servants who delight to revere thy name. Make thy servant successful today. Grant him compassion before this man. And then he adds, now I was a cupbearer to the king. Extremely important element here, brethren, of, of his prayer. And that is, Lord, let me be an instrument of your will. You see that? So here's my prayer. Here's my request. And now, please grant that I would put shoes to that prayer, feet to that prayer, and live the way I pray. Nehemiah didn't pray, Lord, there's a great need here. Send him. Like Isaiah 300 years before, who prayed, here am I, send me. Here's Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is not praying that God you know, would send some ambiguous somebody to take care of the situation, is he? No, Nehemiah is praying that God would send him, not somebody who is nobody, not someday, which is not on the calendar, and not somehow, which is not a strategy. Send me, he said. Let me be an instrument of your will. That's a very, very important part of this prayer. When we pray, we want to be used by God in some way to accomplish uh, his will. Let me be an instrument. Let me serve your purpose. Help me to be a vehicle of your glory. You know, it would have been so easy for Nehemiah to have dismissed himself from this whole situation. Like most Jews. It had been 142 years. Nebuchadnezzar didn't do that to Nehemiah. He didn't tear down Nehemiah's house. Nehemiah wasn't born yet. Nehemiah could easily say, that's not my problem. That's 800 miles southwest of here. That's a long way from me. I've got things to do. I've got duties here to take care of them. Of course, it would involve tremendous sacrifice. A lot of time. A lot of it could easily have talked himself out of this. And then there's that glaring problem. He's the cupbearer to the greatest monarch in the Eastern world at that time. Cupbearers, trustworthy cupbearers, are hard to come by. King gets his wine brought by Nehemiah. And before his lips touch that cup, Nehemiah takes a drink. If it's poisoned, which was not uncommon in ancient times, and even today, a way of disposing of people, especially nobility, then goodbye, Nehemiah, long live the king. And so, because it was a life or death situation for the wine uh, tester, the cupbearer, and for the chamberlain who would go into the bedroom before the king would lie down for the night, and, you know, investigate, lest there be someone lurking in the shadows, ready to put a knife in his heart. Uh, very trusting relationships developed between a king and a cupbearer, a king and a chamberlain. I suggest to you, under normal circumstances, it would have been highly unlikely, highly improbable, that a man like Artaxerxes would have let his cupbearer go off to a distant land. Especially for the long period of time. This is not going to be for just a few weeks or even a few months. This is going to be a long period of time. And except for the grace of God. Nehemiah understands something we all must understand, brothers and sisters, and that is with God all things are possible. Do we believe that? We should have. Jesus said that in Matthew 19. He said, with God, all things are possible. With man, not so. But with God, it can happen. 
So Nehemiah prays a very specific request that God will use him as an instrument of his will. And you notice he prayed, Lord, grant me favor in the eyes of this powerful king. We've been praying for the government because we know God can turn the heads of kings just like he would channel water in his hand. Proverbs teaches. Nehemiah understands that. You know, we, we politicians don't care who Dempsey Collins is. He's a blade of grass in a big yard, grain of sand in a big shore. But I know the King of Kings, as our brother just mentioned. I know the King of Kings. He knows me, and I pray to him, and he can turn the heads of kings like he can channel water in his hand. And that's what's important. I wonder if you and I would respond as Nehemiah did. If we were in his position. Well, I believe the answer may be found in our own personal response to the needs of spiritual Zion today. Open our eyes, brothers and sisters, and see the sad spiritual con condition of spiritual Zion today. Even before this corona tsunami hit, Local churches everywhere were struggling, were they not? You know that's true. In many places where there was once strong zeal, there's now apathy, complacency. One brother asked another, he said, Brother, you know one of the greatest problems in the church today is apathy? He answered, Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that, but I really don't care either. Once fervent prayers are now half hearted, formulaic cliches. I wonder how many eventually figured out Guy Guard and Direct is not one word. Walls once strong faith and devotion, torn down by worldly and carnal interest. Things that are not sinful of themselves, but we're just so divided in our attention and our time. It's one of the greatest problems, one of the things hurting us the most. Saints who once drank deeply from the well of God's word, and as you get older, it just seems to get wider and deeper. Deep enough for elephants to swim. Now they barely open their Bibles. It's in the car, I think, where I left it from Sunday or Wednesday. You were being saved because you were teaching. That's the sad condition of spiritual Zion today. There's rumble, debris. May God open our eyes and help us to see as Nehemiah the needs of spiritual Zion today. And so are we like Nehemiah in our faith and action? Yes, we are. If we see opportunity instead of just rubble, trials or opportunity with work clothes on, we can do the work with God's grace. And when we see probable things that can be done by the power of God instead of the improbable as weak Israel, when we see what's possible with God's strength instead of what's seemingly impossible with our own eyes. When we see through eyes of faith certain victory, definite victory over the enemies of, of God instead of the Goliaths of life, which are so seemingly undefeatable. When we see the conquest of Canaan representative of whatever sin we may be struggling with at present. And all of us have some. We all have some baggage, don't we? We're all struggling with something. That's God helped them tear down the walls of Jericho. We need his strength, but we can overcome the walls of Jericho, whatever sin may be set us right now by the power of God. When we see God's daily abundant provision instead of just two fish and five barley loaves. Some are stuck in the two fish, five barley loaf mode. When we see fertile fields for the gospel instead of a Samaritan woman and others as unlikely prospects, suspects. Opportunity to walk with Jesus through the storms of life instead of seeing the winds and the waves that will destroy us, right? When we see the house of God, the congregation of the living God is something that must be built up and strengthened. And there's no alternative. 
instead of sinful debris. Like Nehemiah, we pray, Lord, use me. Let me be an instrument of your will in helping this congregation to move forward, in helping my home move forward and rebuild walls that have been torn down. God will help you do it. We need to believe that. As we close out our lesson, look back with me at chapter 2, verse 1. I want you to notice the prayer wasn't answered right away. It came about in the month and I sent in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. Wine was before him. I took up the wine and I gave it to the king. Now I had been sad in his presence. Now from Kislev to Nisan is four months. He prayed night and day, persistently, four months at least. God's schedule, brothers and sisters, not our schedule. His wisdom and his purpose, not our wisdom and purpose. All too often we pray, Dempsey Collins prays, but I'm impatient. I want it now. I, yesterday's better. But the prophets, and here Nehemiah once again, teach us to wait upon the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Yes, wait upon the Lord. And don't ever interpret our need to wait as God's no to our prayers. Maybe the answer right now is simply, Dempsey, you need to be patient. But you need to wait on my answer. Trust me. As we trust and as we wait as Nehemiah, we're going to see, let's be busy in good works, ready to serve when the answer comes. Nehemiah was ready. He had a strategy. He was ready to put those work clothes on. And when God, his answer did come, he, he took action. So chapter 2, verse 2, the king said to me, why is your face sad, though you're not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. I just want you to see, as we close out our reading of Nehemiah this morning, Nehemiah had fear. He was afraid. Nothing wrong with being afraid. It happens to all of us. But he fought through his fear. He fought through it. And let's see what he did. Though he had the fear, let's see what he did. What did he do? Read the rest of the story. And you'll see, Lord willing, uh, next month we'll study Nehemiah chapter 2. We'll see how he responded to that fear. What he did. Let us rise up and build I think this is a, a good thing for the congregation here, for all congregations everywhere right now. Rise up and build. The good hand of our Lord is with us. Let us put our hand to the work of the Lord. One man awake can awaken another. The second can awaken his next door brother. The three awake can rouse a town by turning the whole place upside down. The many awake can make such a fuss that it finally awakens the rest of us. One man up with dawn in his eyes multiplies. The church of our Lord, homes everywhere, are crying out for men and women like these. Nehemiah's ready to stand alone if necessary, to teach the lost regardless of what others may be doing, show hospitality, show kindness and love and friendship. And not be beaten down by the storms of life, but continue to, to move forward as much as they can. And so let's rise up and build, knowing the hand of our Lord is with us. Brethren, let's put our hands to the good work in this, in this coming year. We're working with you in that way. Let us stand now and sing the song that has been selected.